Hi, guys. How are you? Good to see you. Good to be here. I uh, appreciate your time. And uh, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, good thing that we have, I think we're, we are streaming. We're streaming to do, doing the Zoom and the live in person. So I'm glad that we have the option of both. It's a really good thing that we have that. I really appreciate that. It's a good offering to have um, the, uh, to, do, to do the Zoom. And I, I think that some of the people that are doing them are fabulous and give, just really giving great, just a great uh, program. So I aim to do the same for you just to show you a few things. And uh, so I guess I'll lead in with asking who loves the skew chisel and thinks of it more than a paint can opener or a back alley weapon? Hmm? Oh, oh, you're breaking my heart. Yeah, you're just you're killing me. All right. So we're going to take a look at the skew and a few things about it. Um, a little bit about my background is I'm actually a production wood turner, um, a legit, legit production turner. Uh, I actually served a furniture apprenticeship. Um, and before that, I had the opportunity, the great opportunity to study with, uh, again, the great Richard Graffin, who I would consider was, uh, to be a mentor, being that he helped me, helped me write a business plan. Um, and really, and helped me get a, a grant early on. And of course, you say early on, you're like 10 years old, right? You're like 20. Now I'm 36, but still yeah, a little young uh, to do this professionally. But this is what I do full time, which is to say that I teach. Uh, and I also I teach around the country at a, a number of places, but I also travel and do demonstrations. And so um, being that I care about uh, things like diversity and just also just uh, bring this to another generation, I don't think that I'm solely responsible for that, but I also think that uh, it's great to see um, people that are uh, my age or younger to, to also do this. And it's a good thing to good thing to bring forward. Wood turning is obviously a fun thing. We're here because you love that. So do I. So I love to be able to share those things with people. It's a good thing to maybe maybe pass a few things around. The thing that we're going to be taking a look at look at, again is uh, skew. This is a very this is a small little item. I'll go ahead and pass this around. I like to pass things around. Take a look. We'll take a look at this small box. Uh, this is all turned, uh, well, not the whole thing turned with the skew, but rather the exterior with the skew chisel. Interior had some other things, other considerations, but things we won't really talk, be talking about this evening. So if we can hear catch, just kidding. No, no. Here, here. Who, who want, third row, fourth, fifth? No. No. You, you really think I was going to throw it? You really thought that? Uh, this is going to be an interesting night. Okay. <sighs> So with, with respect to the skew chisel, you should, also see, you should also see something else, the skew. You should see the shape that I like to grind, and uh, then some considerations with the skew, uh, with, with, uh, with the type of uh, radius that I like to have on it. So I'll, I guess I'll hold up my, <laughs> my traveling board. Uh, okay, can we, should we do that? Is that okay? You guys, because uh, I, okay, yeah, I can sort of see a little bit of a, what we got going on. I'm also going to, I'm also going to pass a skew around, one that I probably won't be, I may not even use this evening. Um, but ne but rather, uh, let's go ahead and do that. So here are some of the grinds that we have for a skew. I'm also going to, again, take a, take a look at the three-quarter inch skew right here. Um, and this is a grind that I prefer. Uh, we can go ahead. And I definitely won't be throwing this. I definitely won't be throwing this. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can you'll see when you take a look at that skew, what I prefer to have on that is um, both sides are ground about 20 to 25 degrees on both sides. Um, being, being, at that, being in that range on both, that would be the uh, inward ground on both sides. Um, that's, so this is more or less the kind of ground that I like to see right here, okay? Just with a soft sweep. I tend to say yes on that, you see here. The reason I would say no on a, gr a grind that you typically see from most manufacturers when you get one straight out of the package to whatever it may be, it's whatever package it is that you get a skew. It's ground to the, usually at the right angle, which is about anywhere from about 20, 25 degrees. However, I find that the uh, the, the shape of the skew is, is usually dead wrong, um, which and this and the, re, the reason I'd say that's dead wrong isn't because it won't cut efficiently in, in, in one way. However, it has its limitations. Um, and its limitations are that if you are to have a tool that's sort of pointed at a, at a right angle, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to properly peel scrape, uh, but it will plane well. So I just find that uh, the kind of grind that you're seeing, that you're going to see passed around, allows for... Um, a greater usability, uh, more options. And so rather than just being able to be, it, it, when you say scraper, that's not such an offensive thing because you can efficiently scrape with the skew. Yeah, okay. There are times when using a scraper, which we show in this, in this demo, um, that yeah. there are some really good things you can do when you are scraping as well. We're mostly not going to be, but and nonetheless, uh, we'll take a look. The reason I would say no to this one is, this, so this is an oval skew. Anyone familiar with oval skew chisels or uh, use them? What do you think? Yes, no? The tendon on your bowls. Okay, wow, that's cool, interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, so with this, so 
so with respect to a noble skew, I don't have much respect for it actually. And the reason for it is, and the reason for that isn't because it's not a good tool. It's great for planing cuts, it's great for rolling beads, and that's more because the stock on its 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 convex, uh, outward convex shape on both sides. That's a good thing if you're actually, if that, and and then you have the you have a more inward set, uh, convex grind here, and that's good for um, planing. So that, it's really not good because if you need flat stock. Where's the skew? I say where's a skew, and I don't have one. I'm doing a skew demo. That's not a good thing, is it? I do. I have a few. So, <laughs> so what I so the tendency with with the with the um, with the skew chisel is that it should it should be able to sit flat like this to rotate. I find that an oval skew tends to just sort of dance around on the curve on the underside of the tool, and doing so it doesn't cut actually actually will not cut a very efficient um, tenon. That would be on that would be on with that would be with respect to grain facing the direction of the the of, of the of the lathe bed. Um, so that's that would be my my take on that. Uh, something like this is another no, as I see it, uh, for me again. And so when I say no about something, it's not to say that because I don't agree with uh, or I don't have a preference for something doesn't mean that it's factually incorrect to you. So just because I prefer this grind doesn't mean that someone else couldn't use one and use it very effectively and get good results. Uh, it's good to be able to separate fact from opinion in wood turning. There's a lot. There, there are far more opinions in wood turning than there are facts. What do you think of that? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, so, but there are facts, and the trouble with the trouble with facts and opinions, or rather, the, the most important thing is that if there is a wood turning fact, it, it's it, it's probably going to save your life uh, to in, in in to follow it and to know why. And so, I'll aim to as I'm narrating the process of going through this, talk about why as I see it. So, uh, the last one over here is uh, that I would say no about is 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 more. This the radius, and this would be I would if, if I was be considering this the long point of the tool, I find that what what what's different about this is that the point of symmetry in the in in a skew at the that the longest area should be at the long point should be the, the tallest point on uh, where the cutting edge is or exists. If if it then if it curves over like this, it's not that I can't uh, efficiently plane make planing cuts. I can. Um, and, I, and it's not that I can't actually expose more of the cutting edge when I'm making when I make when I'm making planing cuts. But the trouble is, it's not a very effective peeler because if I'm trying to make a 90 degree cut, it's going to be far more. And I don't know if we can see. Is that can we see that well? I, I'm looking at this and just don't know. Um, but nonetheless, if we're if I have a, the point of symmetry at 90 degrees here and it's not curved over, that means that there's going to be far less tear out if I'm making a peeling cut, even though I, even though it's essentially a scraping cut. Um, but so we're going to go. So we're going to go through a few things. Uh, the other thing is, I would say lastly about this, because I want to get into turning. I, we don't have forever. Um, I want to I want to talk about a little bit about the um, the apex of the skew. The apex of the skew, this triangular shape uh, should be something where if I'm to draw a dotted line, imaginary line through it, shouldn't be that it's off centered like this. So if you're grinding a skew chisel, it shouldn't be that you just go up to it and then hit one side and then hit one side again and then hit the same side, hit the same side four or five times in a row. If you do that, what's going to happen is you might might suggest, I might be suggesting here is that it's going to be overground one side to the other. So whenever you grind a skew, it's always better to grind one side first and then the other side last. And you'll always have a burr on it. And um, there's always some consideration as to whether you should keep it on or off. Uh, yes. Uh Question from yes, the of course. Zoom. Of course. Um, have you experimented with a slight straight area near the long point as adopted by Alan Lancer? I have, and I think that's a great, I think that's an excellent grind. I do. Um, I like that very much. It's similar to this, very similar to, to, to this. And his has a, seems to be, have, based on what I've seen of it, just has a very, yeah, just a very straight 90 degree for, and, and that's a good grind too. I very much like that as well. It's good. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, but yeah, we want to make sure it's not overground on one side or the other. So every, every time you grind a skew yet, and it's really a very easy tool to grind, um, skew chisels, it's a, it's chisels, flat chisels are the easiest tools to grind. So you're always going to have a burr on one side and then with respect to Alan Lacer, he, if so, much of what I've heard and what I've also seen, he likes to, he likes to, uh, you know, he likes to hone. Um, I don't care for honing. Uh, I think that, um, as I see it, uh, a burr is, you're going to lose a burr in, uh, less than 20 seconds. Really, on any tool you use, you're gonna you're not gonna have a burr for very long. Twenty, I have a twenty second rule for a burr or less. Uh, then for sharp, and then for for tool sharpness, 
uh, uh, you, you only have about five minutes after that before you really have to go back to the grinder. So as a production turner, um, something that I, this is, ah, this is good. Uh, one, two, that'd be two steps, two steps to the grinder and you're, 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 you're set to go. I think that uh, we had to joke, we had to joke in our class today about the grinder, didn't we? Didn't we, Doug? About um, the grinder being too far away. And so we always want to make sure that if we have, if we're, if we, the, you might think the most important thing and the most fun thing about the lathe is the lathe and the wood. It is, but it's also the grinder. You got to make sure that you got to have a grinder, got to sharpen those tools. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about Monty Python tonight. Not yet. No, maybe, maybe, maybe not. But nonetheless, okay. So the grain orientation uh, that we're looking at is going to be, again, we're between centers. Or rather, the, the grain the, the grain's running 90 degrees, so all the cuts that we're going to be making aren't from the smaller diameter to the large. If this is the top of the piece, we're not going from here to here. We're always uh, making cuts from the uh, largest diameter downwards uh, when, we're when we're shear cutting, shear slicing, rather, in this case. So that's enough, is that, that's enough about the board here. Why don't we actually do some turning? I just wanted to make an introduction about the tool. And uh, yes, of course. This, uh, so this is Carter right here. And they, I think if I, I, what I would say about this is that they use higher, higher cobalt content for this. Um, the, the, yeah, the Carter does, these are Carter and Son right here. Um, of course the handles wrapped, I, they, get, they get a little chilly. So it's got a little electrical tape, elect, a little electrical tape on them. Um, so I'll, I don't think we need to, and anyone, if anyone wants to see this, uh, you can take a look at it. Um, I don't think we need to pass it around. Let's do something. Who wants to see some things that are really incredibly difficult and impossible? Sound fun? Okay, that's what a demo is. What's nice about this is being able to show people things that I would not show people in a classroom setting. So that's the fun thing about this. Um, first thing that would be impossible is I'd need a life center. So why don't I grab one? I think I have one in here. And, oh, whoops. And we'll take, uh, we'll keep going, guys. There we go. So the first thing that we're going to do, and can every, every can everyone hear me? Okay, is is sound good? Okay, we're oh, we'll, we're good in the back. We're good in the back. Good enough. So we have our life center here. What I'm going to do first, we're actually going to take the skew and the larger skew that is, this is a one inch skew, and we're going to uh, rough the piece down between centers. Um, I had the fortune to, again to study and train with Richard Raffin. And so I got a lot of technique and understanding about how to actually use a skew and to actually um, use it correctly and uh, to learn to what, learn to learn to learn what not to do with it. So I'm going to just go ahead and find centers by eye and let's see what we have there. That looks pretty close. And we're going to take a look at what's happening with this. This is a piece of American elm. American elm is actually not a favorable wood to turn between centers green. Uh, if I'm just showing, if I'm just doing a, a demo, uh, it would be great if I was making uh, lit, lidded containers or boxes, if I was uh, roughing them out, that is. Uh, but, and you say, well, what are you doing that for? Well, if you use an, uh, fairly, uh, an, un an unsavory wood, that's still a good material to work with. What you're doing is you're gauging your ability to, when you're making planing cuts, to cut them uh, you know, correctly. And so if you can, if you can really clean the exterior of American Elm uh, with, that's green, because it's a very spliny, very soft fiber, even though it's a hardwood, uh, I find that you can really gauge your ability to use the, the cuts. That is to say how much pressure you're applying into it and how much, and how light you should be. The skew is not at, at uh, the, 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 the latest joke about the skew uh, is, is it something like, um, it's, I think I saw it in the Game of Thrones or something as a weapon, uh, something like that. It's not, it's so, so the point is, is that it takes finesse to use a skew, okay? That's the point with the skew. And so we're going to take a look at that and take a look at what it takes for that. The project that we're going to lead into after this is going to be fun. Um, it's going to be uh, actually, um, and we'll we may actually do some, some work with this uh, to just work, 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 um, work across the grain cut end grain. I want to show you some different ways to use a skew. That's really fun. I'm also going to get, go down to a smaller skew chisel, not the three quarters, so you can keep that out there. Um, and then we'll get to the half inch skew and lead into making a, a, a spinning top. But the spinning top will be very different in that it will have a loose ring on the stem, um, which those aren't easy to do. If you can make one, no one can tell you how to use a skew chisel. So we're going to do that. And that's going to be fun. So let's go ahead. When I start the machine, uh, my favorite speed is zero because I want to make sure that I'm not running so fast that uh, it's nearly, uh, nearly dangerous. Um, but we, we just want to make sure that uh, if I'm setting up for center work, that's too close. Uh, that would be too 
far. And of course, what we really want in this case is we want to have the ability to swing the stock and have about uh, maybe, I would say, no more than a quarter of an inch of a gap between the, work, the material and the rest. So that should be good. When you're using a skew, uh, you don't want to be low. Rather, you should be a little bit higher. And it should be that if you're, if it, I find that good area for a good, good metric for using the skew in terms of how high the tool rest is, is that if you have the tool flat, it should be, it should have the tool flat 90 degrees facing inward. Uh, you should be uh, maybe three quarters to the very top of the, either, uh, of the actual live center. Uh, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be, I don't mean the tailstock quill, but rather the live center. So I think that's going to be a good place to start. That would then mean that I'm a little bit above center on the blank. Okay, thank you. So very good. And we'll run this at a very fast speed. I'm going to go ahead and lock the lay just to make sure that when I, I don't have any play in the tail in the in the headstock rather. And you can see that that uh, right there. That's uh, moving. It's way, moving way too much. Let's go ahead and really tighten that. Remove the play, and then we'll go ahead and take some really good cuts with the skew. Uh, we can use when, when when we do this, we're not going to be scraping. We're going to be making some planing cuts, which is to shear slice the fibers. So I, let's see if the play is gone on the piece, and it looks like it is. So let's go ahead and have some fun. Okay, and we'll run this pretty fast. Uh, I'd say probably at least 2000 RPM. That's pretty quick. Uh, one, th one consideration and something to take a look at with end grain though, that is, just, so we're not, we're, we're not actually turning end grain. We're actually turning all side grain, but, the, but, the, but, and, but it, you're turning end grain if you're actually hollowing into the grain, ori the grain oriented this way. If you're hollowing into this area, this region right there, that's actually hollowing end grain. So I would just refer to this as center work. Um, one thing that's good to do to take a look at the grain orientation to see the fibers, see which direction they're facing, is to actually take an incorrect cut. It's good to see something incorrect if you can then uh, counter that and make uh, a claim for how uh, it should be cut. So let's do it. Let's do it the wrong way first. Let's come in, let's come in maybe with a, a correct cut insofar as I have the angle of the tool used. But let's take a look at the grain orientation. We're going to see it really quick. See that right there? Hmm. How about that? That's lovely, isn't it? That's terrible, actually. Uh, what I have right here is I, I have the, the introduction to a nice shear cut coming this way to, in this case, the right. I'm lead, in this case, I was leading with the shorter or shorter point of the, of the, of the, of the, skew, of the skew, the radius or the heel. And what's good to, the reason it's, only, the only reason it's good to do this first, to start out like this, is to actually take a good look at grain orientation. If you, if you see that I'm making a, my first cut is shear sliced into the fibers this way, that's actually quite clean. Uh, not so much over here. So it would follow suit that if I am going to use a skew chisel on and I'm between centers, I shouldn't start at the center. Rather, I should start from the left and make, uh, it, Raffin would say maybe, he says he uses terminology as scooping cuts in his, at least in his old videos uh, to the left and moving my way in or start to the right and moving my way in. So that's what we'll do instead. So this, if you then take the, the fiber and peel it back that way, then you can see uh, what's going on. So hmm. <laughs> nice, isn't it? No, it's not. And so if you see this and you make these kind of cuts or you make this kind of, uh, uh, you might make this kind of a shaving, it's not very, it doesn't lend itself to make you feel like you're going to be very confident using a skew or that it's going to be something that you're going to want to use. So let's change our perspective on that maybe. Okay. And we'll make sure that we're tight all the way through. And we'll lead with the short point of the tool. You can either lead, we can lead, lead with the nose or the short point. I need to get it. That sounds making me crazy. Let's get rid of it. There we go. It's gone. So now it's coming like this. And that would be correct uses of the skew. We're just roughing this down to a cylinder. We're also going to talk about how and why the skew catches. You can see that's a very spliny fiber. It's very soft, and it just kind of it just kind of breaks. Um, so, but it's 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 good material to work with if you want to check to see. Oh, how <laughs> rally has how's that coffee taste in rally? <laughs> Is that good? Did you get your fiber for the day? I was looking out for you. I mean. I heard you skip breakfast. I just wanted you to have it now. This is out. Mm, good. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So let's go to the left now. And the thing about the skew is I can use either the left. I can use the long point to the left or uh, the long point um, or the or the short point to go either direction if I'm planing. So nonetheless, let's keep going. This is the long point. And the other thing about body mechanics is this, is that I'm not doing this. I'm not standing away from the material. I'm gonna have to step up to the plate, if you will, and every few and and also and also then I have to ensure that when I'm making cuts, that the tool's an extension of the body, um, rather than thinking that I'm sort of throwing a harpoon or an axe at it. Okay, wood turning is not something that lends itself to be 
uh, a, 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 an activity for brutes. It's actually a very light dance and a very, uh, it, it, which involves finesse. It's not like being outside throwing an ax at a tree or something, okay? It's not like that. So we're gonna raise the tourist maybe just a little bit more, but also every few cuts, like anything, I can't get this back on the, I can't, I can't put this back on. Oh yeah, it's still not a square, see? Yeah. So what I have to do is make sure that I, it, I, I'm always moving that tool rest in a little bit more back to my about quarter of an inch gap. And what you'll hear is that not quite round. Let's go ahead and get it round. Now I have the ability to, though, instead of leading with the, the cutting edge and the raw weight of the tool, which, which is what I was doing. And I'll, a side note is that you can't lead with, with, with your weight back here. That's, that's no good. I don't need to do this anymore. Typically what I see uh, at first time SKU users or people that are new to it is that they're leading, they're, they're, they're hoping, hoping to God that they don't get a catch. Uh, and they're also um, digging like this. It's kind of like this. With the SKU chisel, what you want to do after you've turned something into round <laughs> is that you want to lead with a bevel, okay? You want to lead with a bevel. That is to say that you don't do this. That's a decent cut, but it's not, it's not very clean. What you want to do to make a clean cut, raise the bevel lead with the bevel. I should see a burnish mark, and if I don't, it's still okay. And then I want to make my cut to the right in this case. It's like that, so. All the way to the end, and I can, again, I'll lead with the long point now. Yeah, you got best or worst seats in the house. I'm not sure in this case. So that's what we're doing. And we're also going to take a few, we're, we're going to take a, a few, a, a look at a few different things with the skew that have to do with how the tool catches, how and why it catches, okay? That's just about playing nicely. Let's go ahead and stop the light and see what we have. Should be a pretty decent surface. And yeah, that's not bad at all. Looking pretty clean. And if we can cut clean like that with the skew, we're doing pretty, our par for the course is pretty good. And that's, that's not a bad place to be. We're also, we're also going to take a look at uh, just different usage of it. Uh, if I'm scraping with the skew, this is not a bad cut to make. I'm actually cutting all side grain. So that's not a bad cut to make um, how, if I'm light with it. I can't do this. I don't want to do that unless I'm really getting down to smaller diameter that I know for, with certainty I'm then going to have a different type of usage with the, school, the skew. That is to say, leading with the bevel first, raising the handle, and making the, pulling that cut forward. Rather, pushing the tool forward with the body. Again, the cuts are not coming from the, the hands. or the, They're coming from the hands and wrist, but the, the, but the force and the pressure isn't digging in by way of pushing into the material. What I'm looking to do is making sure that the, the weight and pressure um, is going down into the tool rest, but it's not staying stationary and, and, and digging down into the tool rest. It has to slide. And so what's causing the sliding motion is the body being, is the tool being the extension of the body. So if I'm doing this, leading with the bevel, all I need is, again, I don't need a bare grip on this. I don't need to, I don't need to, to clench it like this. The skew needs to breathe a little bit. Don't strangle it. Don't choke it out. Don't strangle it. Let it breathe, right? So what you got to do is you got to just go ahead and have just a little bit of uh, just a little bit of support behind the cutting edge, or ra rather behind the unsupported edge. When you're using a skew in planing mode, you have a supported edge and you have an unsupported edge. The, su the supported edge is going to be right here. Can you guys see video good? Is it is video looking good? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, there's our supported edge right there. The nice thing about the radius skew is that I have the ability to basically cut with a wider portion of it all the way to the end. And when I'm making that cut, again, I'm not going overhand like this, which I, but I can. It's just that you have to be careful that if you are planing, whether you're planing to the left with the shorter long point or to the right with shorter long point, um, you want to just make sure that if you're overhand, it's very light, okay? Light with the, with, the, with, with the grip that is pushing down on to the tool rest, okay? That's the whole point. And again, it's the body that is, it's extension of the body, so it's moving forward this way, okay? Those are, those are fairly basic cuts. And what I want to do is tr try to create the, the, nice, the cleanest pass that I can, all to do something else. I want to entirely screw this blank up, and I want to make it look horrible, because I'm going to create some terrible, awful, miserable catches with it. And it's good, to, good to, it's good to do that, because that's really cool to know. It's not good to do. It's good to see and good to know how to create catches, so that you can then know what reinforces 
and uh, how you wouldn't do that. Okay, it's good to be good to be able to do that. So, as, as I see it, this portion of the demo right now is just taking a look at practice and etiquette behind the lathe uh, with the skew chisel. We're also going to probably put this into a chuck and maybe. Uh, maybe make some cuts across the grain as well. Maybe even make a little spinning top without a loose ring on it, all with a skew. Probably not with that one, but uh, with a smaller one. But th let's take a look. L let's chew this up really nicely, leading with the bevel. This is leading with the short point of the tool or the heel. And I'm looking to create as close to 90 degree cylinder as I can, working with the grain. The fibers are facing 90 degrees. What I can't do is have a situation where I'm, where I'm going uphill. If that, if, if, if that happens, as you saw with the first cut that I made with the skew, if I'm going straight in, well, the, the direction of the fibers would indicate that I might, make, I might initially make a really, a really beautiful shear cut going either to the right, this would be my right, your left, or to the left, uh, your right. Uh, but if I keep going to the left, that's just gonna keep peeling the fibers out. So it's actually a good part for the course to try that out and see. Uh, let's see what we have for a finish right here. Okay, and that's clean. Okay, nice clean surface. Um, who wants to screw it up miserably? I do. Okay, <laughs> let's go ahead and do that. And let's show how the catch is created. Uh, so all you have to do is, <laughs> and I'm not saying go do this and try it, uh, but it's good, to, good that you can see a way to do it so that you know how not to, uh, know why, why, it's not <laughs> why it's good not to. I don't think I have to explain why it's good not to. Um, so what I'll do is with reliable certainty, you can create that catch though. But it's, and this is one of the safest, one of the safer catches in wood turning, okay? Um, but it's also one that is it's exciting enough that you'll probably create a new language of, of slang words. Um, you'll probably create new four-letter words. I think I've created new four-letter words using this tool when I first started out. So anyways, lead with the bevel, raise the handle. And that's a really nice cut right there. That's a good shear cut, shear slice. If, I, if the unsupported edge drifts away from that cut like this, that's a catch, right? Let's make another one. Beautiful cut, I feel good, it's going great. And there's another one. Let's do another one. Wow, this is what I call fine detail. No, it's not, it's not fine detail. But let's do, let's do one more. I, think, I, I don't think I could do another one without cr actually cringing and getting over that it's not, that to me, it's, it, it's funny for a minute and then I get over it and I gotta fix it. All right, let's do one more, four catches and ooh, so. Let's see our wonderful results, shall we? Okay. Wow. Hmm. What do you think? Great. No. I mean, if I'm showing, <laughs> so if I if I know how to shear slice the fibers, it's also good to know how <laughs> to create the catch, and and that's to say that I don't want this result. This is not what I want. Um, but just know that with reliable certainty, if that if that unsupported edge drifts, that's what happens. So one of the issues then is if I if I true this back up, which I will, what you what you can also do, and what, one of the other things that can be a, a minor pitfall, not the end of the world, but a minor pitfall, is that if I if I have this tool up, if I have this up 45 degrees, the the, the direction that you'd want to you'd want to not not just present the tool, but be planing at, but to ensure that you're getting out of the way is the opposite direction. It's forward. But if you go forward, the trouble is that you're just digging. Uh, the, the the supported edge uh, th th that would be the, the point the supported edge and rather the point into the material and you're not actually going to be planing so that then that that should then call for advocating for a certain area of the of the skew to be used properly um, and so what you kind of have to do is find a sweet spot and the sweet spot is 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 just a place where you're not over rotating you're you're not drifting too much for that unsupported edge away from the cut and you're not pushing the forward, you're not pushing the, the, the cutting edge or, the, or the, uh, the point forward too greatly that you're digging in on the other side. Far greater is it to um, dig in on the other side forward, but <laughs> that, then obviously these results right here, these are no good. So let's go ahead and fix this. And why don't I go the other direction just to show different directions, different way of using it. Lead with a bevel on this side at least. And That was a deep one, goodness. All the way to the end and almost clean.
So a lot of finger control in this way. And what I do, what I prefer on, with the skew chisel is finger control rather than a, um, an immense tight hole, again, that strangles the tool. I almost have this nicely chewed up and clean. So we're working across, we're working with the grain right now. And why don't we work across it in a minute? And that's with a long point. And let's see if we fix that. There we go. At the center third. Yeah. I'm 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 right at yeah I'm right at about the dead center yeah of the tool yeah and I I feel comfortable there. Typically, if you're new with the skew chisel or um, a little a little fearful of it, I'm just I'm trying to show um, uh, just just being able to just to alleviate that fear by way of knowing that you can create catches all day long and as long as you're between centers to practice creating them. Uh, that's an okay thing to then to then know that if you're between centers, it's it's very safe um, to do. Um, okay, as long as you're working with timber that doesn't have any splits through it, any any cup shakes, any 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 radial splits, we don't want at all. So it has to be healthy timber, and I find that elm is is not a favorable wood to be using a skew with. So I'd rather use it to practice. So this is practice, okay. Um, and that's kind of what, how Raffin would, would be teaching uh, a lot. He, he would, I, know, I remember when I was e uh, either taking courses or assisting in his courses at Craft Supplies, we would just have like little, little pine blocks that would tear or little redwood blocks that were just not, would not give you great finishes. So I like to, I like to take a look at that, look at that similarly in a demonstration. And I found that, and I find that using American Elm uh, really gets you to, if you can cut it very clean in, in the way of leading with the bevel and then not over rotating in the, in the direction away from the cut uh, and get clean surfaces, that's good practice. And so it, if you do get really bad catches, I'm also trying to promote the, the use of a skew um, in, in a way that doesn't make it look like a terrible, awful paint can opening weapon to be used in Game of Thrones or something like that. Okay, it's not, it's not, not really what it is. It's actually a sheer slicer and it's something that can work really well. Um, the other thing uh, will, and that's, so that, does that answer, does that adequately answer you, your question? Okay, yes. Can we see, would you mean, was this good right here? Oh, the profile, the cross section. Yeah, see the cross section right there, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Very good. And so we'll also take, so yeah, that's, so that's, and so I'll just show, just show one more thing. Catches are equal opportunity employers in that if I'm leading, I was leading with the short point to create the catch. Okay. That's just a sheer slice. If I lead with the long point, you can do this. It can do, it does the same thing. How about one catch for the row? That's nice, huh? No. And if I drift it this way, again, I'll get my catch there. Don't be afraid of having catches between centers. Practice the sheer slice and get to get to know the skew a little bit better okay just get to just get get get, get to know it a little bit more ha, learn to develop some confidence with yourself um oftentimes what happens with skew chisels is um you guys still hear me okay okay um oftentimes another thing that happens with skew chisels is you will um oftentimes who's who's bought a set of five tools before in their lives who's you bought a set of five tools set of three tools oftentimes what you'll get is a skew with it and i always hate the ones that have an oval skew I'm like i just shake my head when I open up a box and I see an oval skew, I'm like, nope. Um, and again, the reason I don't like an oval skew is because I can't make this cut efficiently. And we'll talk about a little bit more of what I was saying. But the trouble with an oval skew chisel is that it, it, it's, it's convex. Um, it's, it's, it's inwardly convex towards, uh, towards the flat bar stock this way. So you can't sit flat and make a peeling cut. So, you, it, so that's the trouble with it. And that would be a sheer cut right there. Uh, why don't we go ahead and put a tendon on this piece and then we can uh, get this between centers, take a look at uh, on the smaller scale of what the skew chisel is doing as well, okay? So I will uh, maybe put a tendon on the other side. So this is also a good cut. This is a peeling cut. That's a good cut to make. If I have the skew ground like this, this would be, I don't know if we can see that or, well, we saw that. Nonetheless, the, <laughs> the one, the, when, when it's just ground straight like this, the trouble is, is that I can't take the, the skew straight in to cut a tendon. What I have to do is I have to rotate the body uh, to account for the fact that I don't have a radius on it. So I have to make sure that I, if I'm using a skew chisel, I'd much rather have one that has a slight, a slight radius on it. So I can just stand at 90, 90 degrees square to the stock and just make a nice tendon just like this and be done with it. That's all. That's all. That's, so that's, that's really it. Let's get rid of some, of some of these things right there. One more planing cut. All the way to the end. Okay. 
that's good enough for a little bit of practice. Um, I would say maybe we'll do one more little thing here. Uh, time. Time. Where's the time at? Got an hour? OK. A hour and oh, that's good. Thank you. So let's also take a look at uh, rolling beads. Um, I think that it's, it's good to roll a wide bead. We've seen bead practice. That's pretty common. It's very common, actually, between centers. That's not a new thing. I would say, though, that it, what is good to practice instead of rolling s small beads is to roll a wider, more spherical-shaped bead. Reason for that would be is that if, you're, if, the, if, the, if the skew is traveling over a wider surface, that's then accounting for uh, a, need for, uh, a need for greater balance uh, within the body mechanics used to create it, whether I'm going to the right or to the left. So uh, instead of making some tiny little thing like this, I'll show you what I mean by this in con a, a contrast rather. If I just lead with, and when I, and one thing, and one thing to rewind a bit, if I'm making a bead, I don't, if I'm making a bead and then I'm gonna be starting with, the, with a V groove, I'm not gonna ever be using the short point of the tool or the, uh, not the underside, but the short point of the tool or the heel. I'm always gonna be leading with the long point or the toe, okay? The, when, um, in layman's terms, the, 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 top, the, the highest point of symmetry being the long point is always going to be the one that makes the V groove, okay? So if I'm leading in like this, that's fine. So we'll go make one cut here and another there. Um, what, one thing that can be deceiving is that if I just make tiny little V, or tiny little v groove next to right here and there, it takes finesse to still make the, a bead like that. That's very small, but it doesn't, you don't have to do very much to, to, to really practice it. You want to put yourself in the line of fire, not figurative. I mean that figuratively, not literally. Uh, but what you want to do is if I'm just, if I'm making little cuts like that, it's very easy to think that, you, oh, I know how to, I'm a great, I'm a master bead roller now, maybe, but try something a little bit more difficult. Uh, try something where you're actually leading with the, uh, leading with again, the long point. And let's take this over a little bit further. Now, if you have to make a bead this way, where you just have two V grooves on both sides, better do it this way as I see it for the sake of practice. And, and that, that, that'll reinforce a certain point. Now, it's, it's very easy to, it, it's not easy, but it, it's, it's simpler to, to roll a very, sh a very narrow bead like that. It is, it, is, it is far more difficult and worthy of practice for the sheer slice and practicing that, not just to go between, not just to go from to, to the headstock to the tailstock, but rather to roll a larger bead like this. Now, when I roll a larger bead, I'm actually going to maybe raise the tool rest a little bit. Um, a little bit more, that's a little bit more comfortable for me. Um, what I wanna do is I can maybe put a V groove right at the very center, a very light one. And what I wanna do is start, the, start, the, uh, start the, with the bevel rubbing right in the very center. And if I have to roll a wider bead that travels over a longer surface, what does that account for? That accounts for the need to have greater tool control. And so something like this, you can kind of do eh, eh, and then say, oh look, I can roll beads, that's great. Don't roll little tiny beads like that what you'll probably see, what I'll probably see and what I'll test for is this. Yep, has an apex. That's not a beat. That's just a point right there. So it's easy to make those and think that you have an understanding of the skew. It's a little bit harder to roll something like this that's, that's kind of that's a little bit thicker. It takes a little bit more effort and a little bit more time spent to practicing the skew uh, to lead with either the shorter long point on a wider, on, a, on, a, two, on the center of two essentially wider V grooves and then roll the tool all the way down here like that. Essentially rolling spheres. So we're leading it with the set, or starting at the center. This is to say that I'm, I'm going to the right, your left, I would say. And I would then raise the handle. After, there I see a little bit of a burnish mark and take it all the way down. When I get to the, when I get to the, 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 the portion of where the curve breaks, I can then turn the tool around to the long point and finish all the way down into uh, where the corner is. And reinforce that with the long point on this side. Let's do the same thing on the other side. And that's pretty good right there. And what I'll do then again, I see the break of the curve. Now I'll go ahead and leave with the skew again, long point down there. And so do the same thing here. And I'm fairly happy with that shape. That's pretty good, okay? I'm fairly happy with that. So um, yeah, that's what we'll do. Let's take a look at something else. When, I, when I'm using a skew chisel, and this is what I'll do, I'll go ahead and flatten this. Just flatten that with a scrape, not a clean cut. Again, it's, it's, a, it's an okay thing to scrape it's only so long as I'm getting down to a diameter that I can then account for cleaning it up because that is scraping. I wanna then clean it up. 
and that's what I'll be doing here in a minute. Let's take a look at another thing. When I see people roll beads, often, not, never, not everyone, but oftentimes when I see a bead, a bead being rolled, and you'll see right here, uh, you'll see a pretty good amount of tear out in there if you take a closer look. And that's what I want to show and illustrate that that's what I don't want, but rather what I wanted to create for, uh, for uh, intentionally. Um, so, the, so, the, so let's take a look at what just occurred. When I rolled that bead, I was leading with the short point. When I make a cut, when I make a sheer, sheer slice with the short point of the tool, I'm going to cut a more outflowing um, convex shape. If I lead with the long point of the tool, I'm going to create more of a pointed sort of um, uh, yeah, more, yeah, more of a pointed shape. Okay, um, conical. Uh, it would be more conical shaped. Okay, so it'd be look. It looks more like the six, this cone center right here. That's more the shape that I create. So if I if I start if I if I cut a wider bead and I'm leading with the with the long point, this is this this is the tendency that you would see. Okay, the tendency is you're starting here and you're creating an apex at the center because of the kind of cut that you make when you're leading with the long point of the tool. So here and then going straight down. Like that, so it's not really a bead. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a cone. It's kind of a pointed, kind of a sort of a pointed thing. It wants to be a bead, but doesn't quite do it. I find that it's a lot easier to because of the, if you lead with the short point of the tool to create more of a, an outflowing convex shape and then reinforce on the downhill uh, sweep of that curve to turn the long point around and then go in. So let's fix that. And then we'll turn. Then we'll go ahead and cut across the grain, and then lead into a fun project that's it's pretty difficult. Long point, or actually short point. Now, the other thing is I'm rolling beginning at the center, and all the way down here, like that. Roll the tool around, just like that. You'll see often that when I'm using the skew, I'm I, it's it's more commentary. The, the finesse is more commentary again on the tool not leaving the side. It's so I'm not over here. There's no gap. I always have to make sure that when I when I bring the tool in like here, right here, this then means that if I have any other point of support on the tool, it's not back here. If you're be, if you're below the ferrule of the tool, the tendency is that you're just doing this. You're just pushing into the fibers. You have to make sure that there's 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 finger support and also that the, and that there's usually a point of contact on the tool rest. So if I go ahead and start over like this, oftentimes you'll see that I'll go under underhand. But I can also lead going overhand too, and flipping this around the long point of the tool, and do the same thing on the other side. And I find that again, when I'm starting a bead, going to the left and to the right with the sh with the short point of the tool, that's when I get my more convex shape that I'd like. Nice full rounded bead, so it's more spherical shaped. Okay, practicing wider spherical shaped bead is going to be the thing that allows you to get an understanding of what's going on with the tool a little bit better. And then I'll just go ahead and take that fuzz down here and then go downhill. Again, downhill is going to be the way to, way to go. I'm never going to start here and then go up that way. I'm never going to tear out like that, okay? And so that's a little food for thought there. Now I'll go ahead and uh, take this piece off the lathe, chuck it up. Now we do have a knockout bar, that's good. And that was just from that little scrape in there. And we will go ahead and probably make a little spinning top with this one. We're going to do this with a half inch skew. I just want to show you guys a different way to, to do it. Um, sorry. Oh, whoops. Hmm. And it's down here. Hmm. Where are you? That's great. Oh, there it is right there. This is actually really good because oftentimes in my shape, I have a shavings pile in my backyard. Um, you know, when you drop a grub screw in your shop and you can never find it, right? This has never happened to anyone before, I'm sure. Right? And then you go out to the shavings pile, dump the shavings, then you find grub screws. That's the most aggravating and annoying thing ever, right? It's kind of, but I'm glad that I found this. This is a good thing. It's very good. Make me happy. So let's go ahead and take this out and put the chuck on. And then we'll actually talk about cutting across the grain. We've been working with the grain. Let's cut across. Oh, there it goes again. This, this time it's, oh, thanks. Thanks, Rally. Thank you, sir. Oh, okay. So now we'll go ahead and chuck this piece up. Yes. Yes, entire, it, entirely, yeah. 
Yeah. And I use a term that would be, uh, that, that would be, I would say, I say lead to lead with the bevel, which is to say that I'm not roughing a piece down and just, in, just basically inserting the edge directly into the wood. I never, ever do that. As long as you have a blank, um, as long as you have a square, uh, a square to me isn't a blank, uh, something that's round that you, that you would buy in woodcraft. It's not, those aren't blanks. Those are hunks of wood. And so, so let me make a distinction. So a hunk of wood, uh, whether it be square or round stock, needs to be trued up entirely before you can actually start leading with the bevel to then raise the handle to effectively shear slice the fibers. So um, that's just the terminology I use. Um, yeah, that's all. But yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, basically, it, I do. And that, that's to say on the down, the down slope of the curve getting down into the corner. Yeah, it's it's it, it, it's it's ever so slight, maybe maybe by maybe no more than eighth of an inch of it. It's very small, very small little area. Yeah. So there's a point where you're you're, you're releasing tension from the bevel and you're more you're more or less right on the point. But you're, there is still bevel contact. It's still there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just very minimal. But yeah, good question. Thank you for that. And let's see where we're at. And uh, I prefer, I don't like the T-bars, I break every single one. Um, I have really strong hands, and so the tendency is that if I have a, one of these things, the Vic, the Vic Mark ones, I break, I break, I've broken every single one. So at this point, now I, I just use this to, to, to tighten those. So let's go ahead and work across the grain now and eventually turn this into kind of a fun project. We'll be able to pass this around and then lead into something that's really fun. And uh, you got, this, will be for your, this will be for your club. You guys get to keep this piece, and I hope you enjoy it. It'll be a good one for you. And... Let's go ahead and do this. Now, this is a bit, this is a bit far off uh, away from the chuck. And so what I'll do is go ahead and add a little bit of tailstock support for now. That'll be good because it'll allow us to effectively turn this into waste uh, by way of showing a peeling cut, okay? And I'll actually go ahead and take the tailstock or re um, reveal a little bit more tailstock quill that'll allow me to have a little bit more, uh, a little bit more access with it tool rest. So that should be okay right there. Close enough. And lo and behold, we're uh, just about there. That looks good. So now I'll take a look at, we'll take a look at cutting across the grain. And why don't I sharpen this up? This is a good time to sharpen up and I'll go ahead and do that. We're, okay. Um, the tendency that I have for, uh, also let's talk a little bit about the burr. Um, I like to keep the burr on the tool. Um, the tendency that I have is when I'm, when I'm making peeling cuts, I'm, I'm typically working from the tailstock side to the, to the headstock side. I'm usually going from the right to the left, that, for the most part. Being that I know that, and that's my tendency, I, I prefer having the burr on the top side of the tool. My top side, as I see it, would be the long point facing left. Um, that would be or rather with the long point facing the chuck, this side right here. So what I will then, what I'll do is I'll, I'll sharpen the underside, put the burr on the top here, then I'll turn it around. And the second pass that I'll take on the, on the grinder will be on the underside with the, with the long point facing this direction here. So I'll go ahead and do that real quick. Again, this, these are ground. I, I'm not exactly sure for this. This is, this is somewhere between 20 and 25 degrees on both sides, okay? And this is a fun tool to grind because it's easy. It's not hard to grind. It's very simple. It's just a platform ground tool, okay? So to, in, to, to ensure that I have, that the, so to ensure that I'm going to have the bevel on, on the top side of the tool as I see it, and top side as I, would see, as I see it is, again, with the long point facing the, the headstock. So again, I'm not going to grind that side first. I'm going to grind the underside of the tool first. That'll put the burr here, and then I'll transfer that with the second grind. That'll place the burr on the top side, long point facing headstock. There's the burr on that side, and then I will put it on the other. And the, the last thing that I'll say about grinding here, which is not saying too much, but just a little, because I want to just keep moving, keep turning, is that uh, I want to always, um, let's see here first. There we go. Here. Okay, good. One thing that I don't want to do is I don't want to, in order to keep the, rate, the radius shape that I like, not so much the radius, but rather ensuring that I don't, ha that I don't over grind on the long point, um, I make sure that when I when I present the when I present the tool at the grinder, uh, I'm not swinging at all uh, at, the, at the side where I'm 
going on to where, where, where the long point is. The long point side is never, there's never a swing on the long point side. Where the radius is though, I'm free to swing as much as I'd like. I just be, have to be careful that when I, get, when I get up to the area, when I'm grinding on that near that long point or right on there, I keep the tool at 90 degrees and I don't ever over grind on that side. So I don't have a, 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 a full sweep that looks more like a full, like a, like a full round scraper, which is one of the profiles I have on there that I, I don't find to be savory doesn't be it's not very good so now what i'll do is we'll just make some simple peeling cuts this is just to get the piece down smaller diameter uh and then to maybe just work with this area right in there uh to work across the grain so let's just take some peeling cuts right in here nice thing about being able to make a peeling cut in this way is that again that i have i have a soft radius that allows me to take a wider peel such as that now you'll take a look at all the grain right there well that's nasty that's the trouble with, with scraping is that this is what I'm doing, but it also highlights the grain direction nicely, okay? Uh, you can see this stuff right here. Well, that might be fun if you're making Christmas trees, but uh, not for something like this. What I wanna do is maybe, uh, in, in this case, not maybe, but, but factually, we will actually lead with the long point and, and make a cut that will allow us to, to shear cut the fibers, uh, the end grain fibers, that is, here are all our end grain fibers, all facing out like this. What we wanna do is clean that area up, okay? This will, all, so what we've seen, prior and then adding this to it uh, will then be commentary on being able to know that we're, we wouldn't know how to work with the grain uh, facing uh, in this direction as can be very clearly seen and also working across the grain effectively not just scraping it like that to create all that tear out but rather leading with the long point to be able to clean that up effectively if we know how to do the number of cuts that i've shown you effectively and cleanly um, we can then uh, apply some finesse so it's good to create some catches for the sake of knowing uh, how to how to then get beyond that and the aggression again we're not taking an axe and throwing it at a, at a tree outside we're using finesse and a and a, and it's more of a fine dance okay so now we'll go ahead and lead with the long point of the tool and we can watch this cut right right at where the all that grains torn out near it at least clean up all those fibers okay why don't we go ahead and take a little more down Can see that when I do that, you can rely on the speed of the lathe and just general body mechanics and body weight to make the cut. And I don't need to do this. I don't need to be aggressive with it. That's not a good cut. I can roll it this way. Then I, I can just keep cleaning up those fibers on the end grain. Roll the tool this way. Long point or short point can be rolled. You can roll the tool. Doesn't matter which way. The thing to remember, like I said, is to is to know that if you're leading with the if you're leading with the short if you're leading with the long point of the tool, that's what creates more of a conical shape, like this. And we'll take a look at that again once we get this piece off. And we'll go ahead and oh, that's gone. That's good. That's what we want. Why don't we skip to something else? We'll take a look at a different. Uh, we'll take a look at a different tool. Same tool, rather uh, smaller. We're going to take a look at a half inch and catch. No, let's pass this around to see what we've actually been working on. There you go. That's the ski right there. Thank you. Okay. So now we'll go ahead and make some downhill cuts and take a look at a couple of different shapes that we can make, whether they, whether they're conical shaped or uh, more convex. Um, we'll we'll take a look at both. You guys should always have something that's kind of being passed around. And now we'll go ahead and do that, just that. Uh, we'll make a spinning top, just a bit, something simple here. And what I can do is lead with the, this is with the short point. And why don't we go ahead and start, start right where that bead was. Here. This is more of a convex shape. As you can see, it's more of an outflowing curve. The point of symmetry uh, at the shorter point, as long as I have a soft radius, is going to cut a nice soft convex curve, kind of like this. And when I'm making this cut, remember, I'm not just digging in like that. I'm not like hoping it works. Um, if you're hoping something works and you're, and you're kind of on, and you're, you're kind of not used to it, a little frightened, a little scared, nothing wrong with that. Take a piece between centers, uh, make sure that you have a good grip uh, at the, at the dead center or the, um, you know, on this side on the headstock and, you know, just kind of practice, play around with it. Okay. And so here we go downhill. Yes, oh, the whole way. Yes, the whole way. And so when I'm when when I don't so I don't like the term rub the bevel. I hear that a lot, and it's not to say that that's a, that's a, that's an incorrect term. It's a it's it's a perfectly good term. It's just that what it connotes to me is too much pressure. When you rub something, it's like you're applying pressure. It's like you know, um, 
you you want to you don't want to do that. What you want to do is sort of have it glide over the surface. Gliding is a good term term that I hear. Um, the other term that I the term that I like is to uh, float, uh, or rather. Um, to brush. Brushing is a good, and, and then that always brings to something that's kind of funny because, you know, Bob, you guys know Bob Ross was, you know, painted happy trees. You gotta, you know, you gotta kind of have to paint a happy tree. You gotta brush the surface with the skew. Paint happy trees, everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I like to brush the bevel. Just like that. What's that? Happy little shavings. <laughs> I said that before you. <laughs> that's great. I love it. Very good, Rally. So all I'm doing now is I'm just going to use the skew the whole time. And we're scraping a little bit right here, but that's OK. If we scrape, it just means that we're getting down to a diameter that allows us to shear cut. So that doesn't matter as I see it. So now we're just let's make a nice round top, nice sort of rounded shape, all with the skew. Nice thing about the curved radius, the soft radius, is that, um, again, I can use a little bit wider portion of the skew of the area that's um, almost unsupported too. That's, it gets a little tricky because it's all a matter of finding the sweet spot, okay? When you find the sweet spot, it's sweet, feels good. Uh, when you don't, you'll know, <laughs> as we have seen, right? We have seen. So now we'll go downhill, what's that? Yes, it is, yeah. I find that I, li I like to have the width, I like to have the, I like to have the length of the, the, the bevel, maybe, maybe no more than about a 16th of an inch longer than the, than the, than the stock. So that's kind of where I like to be. Um, that's just where I'm at for to, to, to know that I'm not. Uh, and, and then long, any longer than that, I find that the, the edge digs a little bit too much um, in, in planing mode. And planing mode which would be to say that I'm not necessarily going 90 uh, to the right or left, but also going downhill left or right as, to, as well. So just to say that. So we want to just kind of create a nice sheer cut surface across all of this. Now we're just going ahead and doing the same thing that we just showed before. These nasty fibers, nasty, oh, the fiber, the end grain fibers of elm, if you tear them out, they will, oh, they're, they're, they're nasty. But it's good to see that for the sake of a demo, to see something like this and also see in contrast what's a nice sheer cut. Let's go ahead and then clean that up. And again, doesn't matter because why? Because we're getting down to the smaller diameter to be able to utilize the tool in this sheer cutting mode. But we're also taking a look at a kind of cut where we are cleaning those fibers really nicely, okay? And again, when we do this, there's something that we have to be careful of, okay? Um, well, it's a skew, that's obvious, right? But there's something very specific. When I make this cut, again, I'm leading with the long point down. When I'm being very careful, and that's a very clean cut, you'll see that in a minute. I'm just gonna go ahead and bevel that. I like to keep the blood in my veins. I'm not donating any blood, I'm not donating blood today, okay? Well, let's not do that. So whenever you have a sharp corn, it's never a bad idea to, to um, bevel it either here or to take a long point, take the long point downhill cut just to bevel that nicely. But this also highlights a good area for us to be able to see what's going on in the end grain. So this area is really clean. This area is cleaned up really nicely. And that's pretty clean straight off the tool. What we want to see on this end grain, if you can cut the end grain of elm very clean, as I see it, it you're, you're doing pretty good. And even more so if you have kind of spalted material. It's, good. it's nice to see how spalted the material you can get and how clean you can actually cut it with skew. I like to kind of play around with things like that if I'm practicing, not actually doing piecework. Okay, not piecework, piecework. <laughs> anyway, sorry, had to, had to. Uh, so the thing is, is that one of the one of the pitfalls with the skew, if I'm cutting across the grain, is that I'm actually having to do something counterintuitive. I actually have to roll the unsupported edge into the end grain, but I'm not rolling it in. I'm just making sure that I find the sweet spot, and then I stop, R not stop cutting, but rather stop rolling. So that's a nice cut. And if I, if I want, if I'm so inclined to, and I'm not at the moment. I, uh, <laughs> And if I kept rolling that tool right here, it's very close to the end grain. I'll get a really, really bad catch there. The tendency that, that most have with respect to cutting across the grain is uh, in the, or the, the kind of in, in, the, in, the, in the bad way, excuse me, let's throw this some of that tape over there, is that um, you, you basically are over, you're, you're exposing quite a bit of that unsupported edge into the end grain. But that's not what's actually cutting. You can actually see that the cuts occurring right here. You, can you guys see on video pretty clear, pretty well, decent sort of, kind of sort of? Okay. And so what you want to do is just come in like this, not 90 degrees, but rather at a, at a slight angle. And you'll see that if I'm peeling the end grain, this is just a, this is just a cl cleaning the end grain. Let's do a cut here, here, just like that. 
So those are very clean cuts, all of those cuts. And we should take a look at that end grain, blood in the veins, of course. Let's go ahead and just soften that curve right there, or actually soften that point. So right in here, you can see it's very clean. That's what I'm looking to do is make those cuts across here and cutting, cutting, cutting with the end grain, cutting, cutting with the grain and across the end grain that way. Okay. Um, so one thing that I don't want to do when I'm when, when, what's happening here. I, you can see that when I make this cut, I'm not digging in into very deep. That's probably maybe 16th of an inch uh, inward. If I, and I can make that cut fine. Now, the thing is, is I do have to roll the tool, not, not roll the tool, but rather rotate. If I'm using a skew chisel, I'm not rolling the tool. Rolling is on round stock. Uh, rotation is on flat, as I see it. That's just terms that I use to, uh, for my own diction for that rather. So, what I want to do is make sure that I, in terms of what I don't want to do, I don't want to come all the way over here. And you see that you see this. Uh, if you see a, uh, that's pretty thick right there. I can't start here and start peeling the end grain. It's too thick. So if I'm wider than, if I'm coming over to to, to a V groove that area and I'm trying to peel end grain, go downhill, all I'm going to do is create a V groove and create a whole lot, a whole lot of heat. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll, it'll smell funny too. <laughs> It'll start to heat up and smell weird. It'll you'll basically be burning it. So that's too wide. So just make sure that if you're peeling end grain, you want to be at a with the skew that is. You can take a little bit more off with the gouge. You can take quite a bit more off with the gouge, whether it's a bowl or a spindle gouge. This is a little different. Something like this, I have to make sure that I'm not taking off any more than about sixteenth of an inch. So it's a really more it's a really more really more commentary on knowing exactly where that big groove begins. So it's right here, and that's about sixteenth of an inch or less. And then I can roll the tool, rather rotate the tool with the unsupported edge going into the end grain, but not actually going into it. So that's just a little bit about, about truing up end grain. Now we'll go ahead and see the contrast. We know how to do that. So we see those, we see that, those fibers, those fuzzy fibers, who cares? We can get rid of them in an instant, just like that. Now that we're on a smaller, now that we're on a, excuse me, I didn't get my, apparently I didn't get my grain for the day either. So, <laughs> so now, now we're on a smaller diameter. Let's go ahead and make, perhaps make a stem for this. A good thing that's to, a thing that's good to do right now is that a top, if a top's going to spin adequately, it's it's a prudent and thing to do and probably correct to ensure that if I'm spinning one, uh, it's going to be dancing around on a point like this. What's going to be better for me rather is to do this and just soften that. It's going to be spinning really nice on that. Okay, just soften that. All I did was the same cut here on a much smaller refined scale. Just soften the soften the soften the tip rather than have it be a point. It's going to dance around. Won't spin very well. So let's go ahead and make a stem. Look at all that end grain peeling out. Oh, well, we can just go ahead and apply a little finesse. And this is also where finger support comes into play. Right in here. Just rolling little beads. No big deal. Okay, and we'll go ahead and roll that in a little bit more. Smaller stem, this, is, this has enough weight in it. Um, this has enough, this is, has enough weight in it. I don't want a really long stem. It'll probably just dance around and look like kind of a drunken top. I want this to spin nice, okay? And this will be a very simple one. And then what we'll do is get onto something that's pretty difficult. Maybe add a little fine detail, why not? We're using a skew and a little finger support. The further I am away from the, the further I am away from uh, the chuck, uh, the more finger support I'm gonna need. So now I'll go ahead and maybe make a little bead right here. Just make something that's slightly decorative. Point is, is that it's nice to be able to, and very satisfying to, when you can get a, a finish straight off the tool with the skew and have it work out. <laughs> okay, that's always a good thing. Here we go, a little bit of a stem. That's probably a good length for a stem, kind of short. And we'll sort of round this over a bit. We don't want to have an area where if we're spinning a top, it's pointy and sharp. We want it to be nice and round and smooth, okay? It's like that, and a little V-groove in there. And maybe make the diameter at the, at the very end of it, the tail end, just a little smaller. And one more cut. Whenever I say one more cut, I usually mean five. But in this case, that was like three, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's nervous? I'm not nervous at all. I feel great. <laughs> till it comes flying off the lathe. Then you make another one. All right, so a little V-groove, why not? We're here, let's make a V-groove. Let's make it fun. 
right in there. Can you guys see the video? Okay. Okay, good. And uh, that's so that that stems down to in, in the area where I could, if I want, I couldn't quite flick it off. But if I want, if I if I went like this, yeah, yeah, that's gonna come flying off. Rather, it'll just hit the ground. Um, so I, I, if I want to, I need to just make sure that I'm very, very careful right here. Finger support's important. And I'm making to look, I'm looking at the profiles that I'm creating more so that I am uh, watching the, the edge cut. And that's something that, that, that just takes a little bit of time. But when you can do that, it feels pretty good. And I'm not going to sand this. The other one I will sand and finish. You guys get to have this one, not the other one. I, you can have this one too, I suppose. Um, or maybe what we can do is we can have a spinoff. Maybe what we can do is I'll make one, and whoever can spin it the longest, if we get around to doing that, you can have this one too. That's fun. Little door prize. I don't know. We'll try it. I think we'll have the time to try that. And so now that I'm getting down to this area, it's going to be a good time to uh, maybe roll one more little V. Uh, it's not really a, a, a B, but rather a V groove. And I'll go ahead and lead with the short point, getting down to a maybe close date to an inch. And now it's time to what, hope it works out. Yeah, it should. And I'll go ahead and if you guys can now see the cut, I want you guys to be able to see the very end. That's why I'm going underhand rather than overhand to catch the top. It's not really a catch. It's really just kind of going to drop right into, the, right into the hands. And maybe one more cut. And, and, one of the, and one of the things I'm actually doing is applying a little bit of support right now. That could come off the lathe right now. If I, actually, if I, if I release that support right there, that grip, it's just going to flying off. So what I'm going to do here is just hold that up really nice and lightly. And that'll just come right off, just right there. So there's a little spinning top. And if it spins, it wins, I guess. I don't know what the terminology would be. Um, let's see if it spins in the hand. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I should do that. But I'll do this first, see if I can spit it in the hand. Oh, not quite. Sort of, kind of. Sort of, kind of, not really. Let's spin it on the board. And if not, we'll actually, we'll actually spin it on the ground, too. It's a good thing to do. Oh, it spins. It's a good one. Yeah, let's do it on here. There we go. Just like that. It's a good one. Just like that. <laughs> and, of course, a good, a good top spins up. Oh, it's still going. There it goes. Yep. Cool. That's a spinner. I wasn't, and so what, what helps with that though, again, was to, it went, before I, before I fought, made a final shape on the stem was to ensure that I just made that, that the, the tip of that flattened. I flattened it. Yeah, just flattened it a bit with the shear cut. So if you do that, it works out pretty well. The trouble with this now isn't the, is if I maybe take a bit of sandpaper and see if it spins, it spins up time, please. Oh, perfect. That's great. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry? Okay. Okay, that's great. That's perfect time. Thank you guys for letting me know. I'll take a little sandpaper here. Um, and we'll see if this spins upside down. Spinning top that spins upside down is, uh, it's, it's, it's good then. So if it doesn't spin at all, it's just a lopsided chess piece and just tell it, just lie to everyone. Just say, yeah, it's exactly what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. Don't, I promise you, they'll believe you if they're not a turner. So don't show any of your wood turning friends. <laughs> so I know let's, let's get rid of it. Maybe, maybe we'll do it on the board. We'll try. So that spun pretty good. Um, we'll see if it spins upside down. It's always a good thing to see if it does. There it goes. Yeah. Here. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. So we're not, oh, we're not done. We're not done. Uh, no. Yes, of course. <laughs> Catch. You good. Got it. Fastball. No. Yeah. All right. You got it. <laughs> now let's get on to something else. Um, what I'm going to do is take take some dry stock and uh, put it between centers. Rather put it put it um, on the the Vic mark here and um, make a spinning top loosening. We have a half hour, um, so that's we have, we should have plenty of time to do something simple. I have some good dry stock in here. See what I have. A little less, okay, okay, I, I, okay, I hear the, I hear what's, I hear that. <laughs> so now, why don't I just? This is what I have. I'll take some black walnut, and I'll rough this down with the skew. Put it between centers. Um, okay, let's we'll start. Let's, and what we're gonna do here is make a spinning top with a loose ring. Uh, which one do we have out there? Do we have the larger one? 
Um, you know what? Actually, let's make a spinning top of the loose ring with a smaller bit of material. In fact, that doesn't need to be. Um, why don't I just make it with? I have a, I have a nice piece of Bacotti in here. Uh, did. Oh, here it is, right there. So maybe if I can use this, if that'll clamp down, it might not. It might be too small diameter. Yeah, it's probably too small. Yeah, it's just small. Oh well, I'll just be quick. Do that. So we'll go ahead and open this up. Uh, if we have the larger diameter skew, I'd pre oh, no, it's over there. Never mind, pocketing myself. Go ahead and put this. Oh, really? Hey, I'm growing up, though, a little bit. Every day. Second you're born, it's all downhill from there. That could be a skew chisel joke. Haven't applied that one yet. I think I'll add that to my material. Uh, all right, good enough, good enough, tight enough. Let's go ahead and tailstock support in this case. I don't ever want to. So I heard, I heard a story about Richard Raffin, um, one where he tried to put a piece between centers at, in Utah, and it came flying out, hit him in the head. Um, that's an interesting story. Um, I don't know. Mike Mahoney told me that story a, a, quite a long time ago. It's an interesting one. Were you there? You were there. Okay. So what that then is to say, tailstock support. Okay, in this case, okay, tailstock support. So I am going to rough it down with the skew again. You might see other tools over there, but they're not really there because it's a skew. It's the skew we're going to use. And I'm a, I don't mind having a bit of a gap over here just for the sake of being able to just rough this down, rough, rough this down, I guess roughly, didn't mean to make a pun, uh, but just enough to be able to then put a tendon on here, turn it around, and really we're gonna zoom through it, okay? We're gonna zoom. And here we go. Okay, larger skew, heavier cuts. I could use the three quarters too. Um, well, let's go ahead and use the larger. Let's also raise this up a bit. All, all finger control. This is not a heavy brutish cut. Skew chisel is not a heavy brutes tool. Okay, it's a light cut. Like that, and. all the way down, maybe a little bit further. We do want to put a tendon on this, but I want to just sh shorten the stock a bit. Fingers are just making sure that I don't, well, again, I got my fiber for the day. I don't need it anymore. I'm good. And I think that's a good tendon right there. These are all just downhill sh shear cuts, leading with the long point in this case. You can see if you're watching not the tool but the body, body's making the cuts. And that's going to be sufficient for where we're at. You can remove that and don't need that. And flip this around, put it in the chuck. That should be a sufficient, and, and, I, and when I'm doing this, I, I want to make sure that I don't have too much, I was a little bit too far off the tool rest. This is going to be okay. Uh, I, if I am, now if I am to use uh, a, a kind of jaws for this, I find that the, a, 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 the, the stronghold, or not stronghold, um, but the um, shark jaws are really great for this. The Vicmark shark jaws are great. I love the Vicmark shark jaws. They're great for, for, for holding uh, a flat, or actually for holding squares rather are great. And in this case, we'll go ahead and call this good enough. So we'll, we'll, make, we'll make one pretty quick here. Uh, why don't I get this started, put a fresh edge on, this, on, the, uh, on the, uh, the half inch, and we'll get going. I'll go ahead and rough this down first. Trouble is, is that if I, if I, gri if I grip onto a square from shorter, um, with the shorter dovetail jaws, that's not, it's not a good situation, okay? It's potentially a pretty bad one. Maybe we'll start the cut downhill.
good enough to be able to then sharpen this up real quick, lower the tool rest a bit, move that in. I got some sanding pads right there. I'm actually going to finish this with lacquer with a with a with a poly uh, finish. Going to be nice and quick. Thank you. Okay, good enough. Have the burr on the what I would perceive as the right side of the tool, correct side. Now we'll go ahead and skew away. All downhill cuts. Call that decent. If I scrape like that, it's okay so long as I get down to the smaller diameter, okay? Leading with the long point now. Nice sheer cut. Fist and swipe rather than fingers and, well, lose them. You don't want to lose the fingers. Fist and swipe. That's what we want to see whenever we have shavings build up on tool rest, okay? Should be pretty clean straight off the tool. That's looking good. I want to round this over a little bit more. And again, it's not a bad idea to, at this point, maybe make a little fine detail right there. Why not? Because we're here. Finger control, not, uh, but again, it's not an axe throwing contest. That's not what wood turning is. Not an axe throwing contest. And then what I'll do, maybe just go ahead and Make a nice little detail right there. It's decent. You guys get you guys get to have this piece. I want you guys to have it. Auction it off. Do what you like with it. Who's won? Who's won the spinning top contest? In terms of the longest spin, have anyone been calculating it? No. Okay. So let's keep going down. Now, the thing here, when I'm making the loose ring, I just want to make sure that I have clearance on both sides, enough to where when I'm using the long point to get under what is just essentially a bead. Like that. The bead will be somewhere maybe about right here. I think that's a good spot. Do I have the clearance on this side? I do. I have the clearance plenty on that side. Let's put the bead right here. That'll be good. Now that's too large of a diameter, but I, what I'm doing is I'm basically setting up the area that I want to break it free. Right about there and right about here. All sheer cuts. I don't have, I'm getting thinner, which means I need to make, take a look at making a final shape on this side and leading downhill with the long point. Why not? Now I'm pretty much done cutting over here after maybe that cut right there. That's going to be good enough. There's my bead right in here, right about there. That's going to be a good spot to break this free. Close to it, a little bit too large diameter. I'm going to roll this bead, and with the short or the long point, doesn't matter. And that's pretty decent looking. I'm happy with it. And make a downhill, little downhill cut, just like that. And that's looking good. Now, again, the other thing I can do, I don't have to keep scraping. I can also true up the end grain. like that. So what we'll do, we'll break this free. A little bead right there. We have to make sure that we have clearance on both sides, which we've done. We pretty much checked for that. And we're now at a place, uh, now at a point where we can almost do that. Almost break it free, rather. Got to go under this side. That's with the long point. And maybe we'll break it free from the other side. What I'm looking to do is match the diameter. And but the other thing is match the diameter that is that is on the stem. What I, what I have to be what I have to be cautious of is ensure that the width matches the overall height of the bead or the or the width of the bead on its side. If it's too thin, bead's just going to break off. Okay. And you might say, well, what? Where are you going to sand the bead? No, I like having the bead a little rough. 
not rough, but just sheer cut. And I think that's going to be going to be good on this side to then break free really soon. Kind of fun when this thing breaks free. It's not good when it breaks off. That doesn't feel good. When it breaks free, yes. And what is it going to do? Is it going to work? Ah, close. So close. Take a little bit more off that side. With all the long point, when I make this cut and to break it free, I never use a short point. It's always a long point. And it looks like about right there. I just about got it. Maybe one more little pass in there. Again, that's my, my <laughs> never I say one, I always mean five more. There we go, loose ring right there, okay? Now it's not done yet, it's almost done, okay? Let's finish it. Let's do it right. Okay, and that's kind of fun to be able to kind of move this thing around, it's fun to see. The thumb just is there to add the support. If I'm working with dry material, all this stuff just jumps this way, and I kind of like that more when it's green, okay? And uh, if it jumps up too high, I'm wearing it, and you can see I don't have straight hair, and I have it, it, it kind of gets buried in there, okay? Finding oak from six months ago in there. That's the trouble with the story. It really is the actual story of my life. I'm not even lying. Okay. So I'm happy with the curve. Why don't I add a little bit of interest right here with the V groove? And why don't I have that, that this side of the bead sort of roll down into it? Little bead over here. I'm pretty happy with this piece. And let's go ahead and straighten up the stem a bit. Do a little bit of sanding. We don't need to do much, probably just 220. And then whatever I have that's a little bit, a little bit uh, higher grit than that. And if we get that to stay right in there, the good thing about making a little architecture or architectural rather design implement right there is that oftentimes the beetle just stay, not always, it can just sometimes just stay right in that area. And I guess it's not going to. Yeah, there it goes, it's staying, that's good. And that'll allow me to be free of this other side to then be able to then make a so sort of rolling cut. I have plenty of diameter to then remove over here, plenty. Uh, let's do a little bit more, round this over round this over, and yeah, I think I'm happy with it. So yeah, that's kind of a decent piece. Maybe a little V-groove, why not? And a little bit of sanding. When I start sanding, I will go ahead and begin with 240. I think that's what this is. Nope, that's not what that is. Let's start with something. Something that will be a good spot to be at. And, ah, there we go. That's just what, uh, that's just what I wanted. A little bit of 240 right there. So that stem is thin, but it's not so thin that it likely will come off. Uh, so that's pretty good. Now the stem, that's probably close to a proud quarter of an inch, maybe five sixteenths. That's to say that the smallest diameter at the end of the stem right there. So that's going to be an okay area. But I have to be careful that when I sand, I'm not applying too much pressure over here. And I don't want to sand too much. If I shear cut the material clean enough, what I'm not looking to do is start sanding at um, like 20 grit, right? You probably thought I'd say something funny like 60, but no, say, when you say 20, it's just funny. You have to laugh at 20. Is there even such a thing as 20 grit? I don't even know if there's such a thing as 20 grit. I, I imagine there is for like belt sanders or something. I imagine there is. So this is just a pretty light. And we're just going to put maybe a, just a little sandpaper on here. This is 220. That's all this should really need. 220 and maybe uh, 320 or 400. And the other thing is, I'm sure no one in this room loves sanding. I don't love it either. Well, guess what? That means spend a little bit more time um, practicing on your tool control, okay? Work on tool control. You will find that the world is a brighter place insofar as not having to begin 
with any <laughs> with 20 grit okay yeah is what it is it's all i got so that's pretty decent right there for uh for that um pretty happy with what we have let's just go with something else and what do we have here that's that's a thousand that's way too high let's see what we have for for grits over here um i'm looking for maybe something like a 320 or 400 will be okay and we should be good matt one yes. of the uh, zoom members uh i'm asked sorry if you use the sorby ring tool i'm sorry have you used the sorby ring tool the sorby ring tool never i've never used one no i've not mm -mm. Yeah, that's scraping. But no, I mean, it's not to say that if it's scraping, it's bad. If you get confident using that tool and it works effectively, that's a wonderfully good thing. I find that, and, and if, if that's all you want to do, use, that's fine. If someone wants to scrape, it doesn't, it doesn't offend me. It doesn't keep me up late at night and I worry about it. That's fine. It's just that I, my preference is that I would prefer to slice the fibers and that um, if, you, if you have an interest in doing that and want to, um, starting with a tool like that can really help to develop the confidence necessary that if you then want to go beyond that, maybe use a skew. Go for it. So that's how I see it. And we're just looking for a just, uh, oh, that'll be good. That's 400. 400 is going to be a good finish after the 220. It's cut clean enough that just a higher grit after the 220 will be good. I actually like sanding with little two and two and a half inch pads because they're con because by the time it reaches a corner, it will a, 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 a circle, then it, uh, it has a, it's, it's convex. It's not facing inward, and it has a tendency to not want to round over, to roll over fine detail. If I'm going to sand fine detail, which I, I rarely do, but, but, but often will only if it's anything about 220 or less as well, just for fine detail. And then after this, what we're going to do, we'll add a little bit of, uh, we'll add some myelins. So I, like, I like the myelins finish. Actually, what I have is, no, I have water locks. I have water locks, and then put some myelins over it. So it'll be a little, a little be, be a nice little, uh, put some shine on this, followed by uh, a little bit of wax on the top with some carnauba in it. We should get a pretty decent sheen on this piece. And yeah, we'll be good. So sanding, again, is not one, not one of those things that everybody loves. I would say that the cleaner you cut, the more friends, the, the more friendly you're becoming with the sanding process, because what you're doing is very much like in furniture, uh, sanding is something that's very much a part of the burnishing and finishing process. You want to think of using turning tools the same way, where you're basically creating something very clean and nice off, straight off a tool to then be, if, if at all, with any kind of finish, just apply a little bit of sandpaper and think of it more about um, the, the finishing process than it is about something that you have to arduously go through that you hate. Um, now, you can arduously hate it if there's a lot of tear out. Uh, so consider that practice, not necessarily something that you want to finish. Okay, and there we go. So we'll add a little bit of myelins. Uh, I, uh, this will fly. This will fly your way. So let's turn this down significantly. Uh, yeah, that's going to be good. So I'm I'm at about 400 RPM. That's going to be a good place to start. I'll uh, we'll go ahead and actually. Uh, you guys are going to love this though. <laughs> this is not open. It's not a paint can opener, but it can open finishes too. It can open finishes. Look at that. Hey, I, hey, I know how to use this. I can do it. I can do it. So that's all right. <laughs> Oh, that's fun. Oh, goodness. So we'll add a little bit of, I have, a, I have some, what I have here? I have, uh, it's just a Waterlocks high gloss. Uh, this is pretty good for, this is something that I would use for spinning tops. If for anything else in my, in the kind of work that I do and the piece work that I do, um, I would never, ever, ever use this. Uh, not because it's, uh, it's some kind of sinful, evil, wrong thing. Rather, the, the places that they go just don't advocate for a kind of finish uh, that, that would be uh, basically non-repairable. Uh, and then become blotchy uh, over time if it is used. That, that would be to say if you're using a poly finish, which I, I just typically do not like. I don't like poly finishes, by and large. Not to say that I don't see beautiful work over there, really anywhere else that we're, we're, uh, turners are using them, using it wonderfully. So that's a matter of my own personal preference, not, saying, not to say that using poly somehow makes you bad. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go ahead and just, we have a little bit of, uh, that looks kind of nice, it's pretty. It's kind of fun to see the ring dance around. And we'll go ahead and just keep applying some finish there. I'll speed this up so that it oxidizes pretty quick and maybe add a little bit more. Let's 
looks good. And why don't I then just a little dry buff, ever so slightly dry, and then add a little bit of wax. When I add wax, typically the, the, ca the case with me, and I'll go ahead and slow this down. I don't want you guys to wear it. Um, I'll add just a bit of wax, just a little. And that's too fast still. Let's apply it near eh, between three, three to 600 RPM is good. And that's at 600 RPM or near it, a little over 600. A little bit of wax with scotch Bright. Any raised grain at all should be uh, taken away for the most part. And then after this, what we'll do is we're going to go um, really fast up to probably, well, maybe not that fast, maybe about 2,500 RPM is a good place to be. And what I'll do is I'm not going to, now what I typically do if I buff, I just kind of roll this up, put it into a ball of the of kitchen paper, so, or rather a soft cloth, preferably. Uh, in this case, I'll just go ahead and take a strip of this, fold it a few times, call it good enough for being able to do a light buff, okay? Very light. And again, you guys get to have this piece. I want you to have it, keep it, have fun with it. So then if you break the ring off, don't ever tell me, right? Okay, let's just call that good. We're running low on time, I imagine. We're getting close to the end. It's gonna be good to be able to, for you guys to be able to get home safely. It's dark and I think it's snowing out there. No, is there snow or, I, does, does it snow in Colorado? No. It's, it's a little cold out there. So I'll go ahead and take the half inch right in front of my face and remove this piece. It's one of those things where it's a novelty item more or less. So if it doesn't spin, um, it doesn't break my heart, but it, I'm, I think it will. I hope it will. I think it'll be okay. And I'll go ahead and slow this down just a little bit more from the speed from buffing, maybe around, in this case, uh, 1800 is good. Downhill sure cut. Let's make the last cuts count. Uh, and... Sharpen this up just a little bit. Should be okay. Go back to it. And we'll go ahead and catch it underneath again, just so we can make sure that we see it. See it released from the piece from the stem rather. Catches right now really suck, okay? They suck, they're, they're not fun, they're not fun. Um, but as long as the piece wouldn't, doesn't break, should be okay, or the, rather the ring. And we just wanna make sure that, that the down slope of that curve is nice and fully round and doesn't have any bumps in it, and then that'll come off right about now. There we go, that's done. So we'll take some 220, and in this case, I'll just kind of round it over like this a little bit. A little bit of oil, we'll call that good. And let's go ahead and have it so that we can actually see it. Don't need these anymore. I'm happy with it. I give it about a, I give it a one to 10. I give it about a 7.5, 7.5. Does it spin? Let's see. Who wants to see if it spins? Who wants to see if it spins? No, it's a novelty item. I'm just kidding. No. I won't do it. <laughs> I will do it. I do it anyway. I don't care if anyone, I don't care who raised their hand. I'm going to spin it anyways. I don't care. I don't care if you raise your hand. I'm going to spin it. All right, let's do it. Let's see if it does it. Ah, yes. Does. The ring's kind of a fun feature, too. I like to see that. It's fun. So if you can do that with a skew, no one can tell you how to use one. <laughs> if you can make that, and, you say, and I look over your shoulder and say, so, and you're like, you could say, no, I'm good. Basically. No, I'm, that's, that's real talk. <laughs> let's do that again. Ooh, that almost, that's kind of fun. Does it spin upside down? Who wants to see? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. And then we'll pass this around and we'll have a good, you guys have fun? You have a good time? Good, excellent. There it goes. Ah. Whoa. All right, that's it. <laughs>